down for you. Oh, Miss Carolyn needs a copy over in the corner. If, if anybody back there is listening, and I'm sure somebody is, Carolyn, those doors will come open any time. I see activity through the doors back there. So uh, anybody else need a copy? Okay, Romans 16. Let me say this before we start tonight. What we're going to look at is something that I had thought about bringing back on Sunday because I think it's so very important what we're going to look at, the verses that we're going to look at this evening. Uh, only two of them. Only two of them. But they are, they are just no matter when, but especially in the day and age in which we live in today, they're so important. And so let me start with the introduction tonight. Here's what it says. Last week in our study of Romans, we started to look at a warning which Paul gave to the believers at Rome. It was a warning concerning false teachers. Verse 17, watch it. Here's what he said. He said, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. That was where we started. That's where we left off last week. Okay, so I, I'm going to repeat a few things that we said last week. These words echo what Paul gave to the believers at Ephesus. And I want you to watch this in Acts chapter 20, 29 through 31. He said this, he said, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now watch this statement. Also of your own selves shall men arise. Don't miss that. You see where they're at? They're mixed right in. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Let me keep going on the paper. Now it would be easy for us to rush over the verses here in Romans 16 concerning the warning, but in so doing we would miss truth that is vital to us in this day in which we live. And I say that because of another couple verses that I shared with you last week. First Timothy 4, 1 through 3. It says, now the, Paul writes, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Paul said this to Timothy. He said in the latter times there are going to be people that depart from the faith and they're going to, many of them are going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, which means this, that there are going to be people that are going to be preaching these doctrines and there are going to be people that are going to be promoting these spirits. Watch the next line. Paul warned Timothy of false teachers in the latter times. Let me remind you that that, that, is, that, that that we are living in the latter times. Therefore, this warning in Romans 16 certainly pertains to our lives today. So we will, uh, we will call this, uh, I guess if we were going to title this, Watch for Deceivers and Dividers. Watch verse 17 again because there are there are two commands in this verse that I want you to see, verse 17. Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Go back to your paper. Let me go over something here. There are two commands in this verse that we must consider closely. Command number one, mark those who teach contrary doctrine that will cause divisions and offenses. So they are to be marked. Let me go on. The word mark in, is in the present tense, which means this is something that needs to be done all the time. To mark them means to watch closely. It actually has the idea of scrutinizing false teachers or watching them closely. Recognize who they are and keep an eye on them. Keep an eye on their followers. Keep an eye on anybody that is connected with them because they are extremely dangerous. That's what he's saying. That's the idea right here. Let me go on. Now let us understand, and I need to add this, this is not permission to watch others very closely waiting for them to make a mistake or to say something that is not correct. That's not what he's talking about. That is what people involved in legalism do. They just wait for somebody to somehow along the line make some kind of mistake. 
They watch other believers with a judgmental eye. Jesus warned about doing this on the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, here's what he said. He said, judge not that you be not judged. In other words, that, that could read like this. Stop criticizing. Stop criticizing. Watch this. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or will thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thy own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So that's uh, the situation there was he was addressing, I believe, the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And I think that was what the beam was that was in their own eye. They, the, the Pharisees were so critical of everybody that did not walk or live the way that they lived. And so they were always criticizing others, but they themselves were far from being perfect. And so they were very critical of everyone else. And I believe that's what Jesus addressed here. And that's not what Paul's saying here whenever he says, mark them. He's not saying live uh, and, and, and look at people in a suspicious way all the time. That's not what he's saying. Watch this. Paul's not commanding his readers to watch with a critical eye. He's telling them and us to keep an eye out for people who teach that which is contrary to the Bible. That's what he's saying. Watch out for people that teach things that are contrary. Those, when, when you hear something and it causes a flag to go up in your mind, pay very close attention to that individual. That flag has went up in your mind for, for a reason. I remember somebody told me not too long ago, it's been a couple of years, I'd say not too long ago. That's not very long ago anymore. Years ago, a couple of years was a long time, but now it isn't. It's a short span. But somebody told me that they were in a church where there was somebody preaching a false doctrine, and, and they said this to me. They said, you know, there's just a feeling that I get whenever I sit in that church that something is not right. That's called discernment. That's called discernment. And so when we hear somebody teach something and it just it just doesn't seem right, it doesn't line up with the scriptures the way we understand it, then we ought to question that and, and, and we ought to be very careful with that individual. So we mark those individuals that teach things, and that's what happens when somebody comes in and teaches something different. It causes divisions and offenses within the church. Somebody might side with them. Somebody sides with somebody else. So that's one thing, marking them. But watch number two. This is what I wanted to get to. We are to avoid those who teach contrary doctrine. Let me read the verse again. I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Now watch this, and avoid them. Avoid them. Get away from them. Separate from them. Because they are dangerous. Watch this. Out of the two commands, this would be the one to place the most emphasis upon. We're to avoid those who teach false doctrine. Many have not heeded this command and they have dug into false teachings and they have exposed themselves to false doctrine and the end result has been tragic. Many have been tossed to and fro and have been carried about by the false doctrines. Many of these believers have thought that they were strong enough to stand against the false teachings only instead to be carried away with them. And I'll give you this warning that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12 he said, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There are people that are proud enough to think that it doesn't matter what they get exposed to, that it will never affect them. That is the worst attitude to have. You are setting yourself up for deception. Let me go on. Watch some of this. We must be very cautious to mark those who teach false doctrine and then avoid them and their teachings. Watch the words of Noel. Watch what he writes, and I, and I quote, Satan has deceived some good preachers into personally investigating evil people and conditions in order to preach against them. I've heard that before. I study, people say, well, I study this so that I can preach against it. Let me just say this. 
if you study the word of God, you don't have to study the false doctrine because if you know the truth, you will automatically recognize the error of the false doctrine. You understand that? So we don't, there is that tendency to go over and jump over the fence and say, well, I'm going to study this false doctrine just so I know more about it. You put yourself in a very dangerous situation, very dangerous. Watch this. Let me go on. But God says, the things that are done of them in secret, it is a shame even to speak of. Preach the word, for therein will be found abundant discoveries of evil and denunciations thereof. But being the word of God, it is holy and may safely be used in exposing evil. It is like the sunshine that lights up the foulest alley without it, without being itself defiled don't go down the alley personally lifting the lids of the garbage cans or you will smell of it unquote you cannot do that you cannot put yourself in contact with that false teaching because what it will do is this i can assure you this that somehow some way it is going to influence you it is going to influence you let me go on Many ministers have taken the walk down the dark alley, lifting the lids of the garbage cans, and in so doing, they've been swept up by theological air. They do not lose their salvation, but they crippled their ministry. They have had their usefulness for the Lord severely damaged, and some to the point of destruction. They are no longer useful. That can happen. They get off on a false teaching, and, and, and they get all wrapped up in that, and they get set on the shelf because they're no longer useful. Let, let me go on. Watch this. We must avoid those who teach false doctrine. We must turn away from them. Let me share the words of Noah again on this thought, and I quote, the, watch this, the inability to turn resolutely and wholly away from false teachers and evil workers is a mark of spiritual ill health, the cadence and possibly of the state of spiritual death itself. Mad dogs are shot. Infectious diseases are quarantined. But evil teachers who would divide to their destruction and draw away the saints with teaching contrary to the doctrine of Christ and his apostles are everywhere tolerated. How ghastly and ruinous is this false toleration. Let us take heed lest we partake in the evil deeds of such evil workers unquote you understand here's what happens today there is so much compromise whenever there is somebody that 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 teaches a false doctrine churches compromise maybe because the individual is a popular individual and so they want to have him in to somehow draw a crowd listen that that is absolutely wrong you cannot do that and you and i cannot we cannot plug in with those and, uh, that teach the false doctrine because eventually it's going to poison the mind is exactly what it's going to do. And I don't, uh, going back to 1 Corinthians 10, 12, again, I don't care who you are or who we are. We're not going to be strong enough. Listen, you're, this is a spiritual battle. And, and whenever it's a spiritual battle, you remember back in the book of Jude, that whenever Satan wanted the body of Moses, that even Michael the archangel would not dispute with him. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. And I'll tell you why, because Satan is the most powerful being ever created by God. And so for you and I to try to match minds with him, I'll tell you right now, we are outmatched. And we don't stand a chance. Watch, what, uh, watch this next part. The Apostle John addressed the subject of false teachings in Second John. 2 John chapter 1, verses 9-11, through 11, he wrote this, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Okay, so now watch what he says here. And if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, Watch this, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Let me tell you what's said there. When we support an individual, I don't care if it's family, I don't care if it's, if it's somebody that used to be your best friend, I don't care what position they hold, 
But if we support that individual and they teach a false doctrine, verse 11 makes it very clear that we are then partaker of the evil deeds. We are then guilty of supporting exactly what they preach. There's a lot of application with verse 11. There's a lot of application. Uh, I heard a guy teach it one time like this. He, he said, when the Jehovah's Witnesses come around to your house, don't you dare bring them in. Don't you dare bring them in and think, well, I'm going to dispute, I'm going to debate with these guys and maybe I can show them the truth. Don't you do that. And whenever they leave, don't you dare say to them, hey, I hope you have a good day. Because then guess what? You've just wished that they had a good day. You've sent them off and you have just basically commended them for what they preach. Not only that, you bring them into your house and you sit them down, and I know a lot of people do this thinking that somehow they can change their minds and have a debate with them, and then they leave, and then they go to your neighbor, and your neighbor knows you, and they know where you stand, and they know that you're a believer, and they go to your neighbor, and the neighbor says, no, I don't want to talk to you, and they said, well, Keith up there, just he just left us into his house, and he had no problem with us coming into his house. And you see what it does? It opens the door, and I can assure you Satan will use something as simple as that to be able to get in in order to spread deception. Watch this. Watch. Let us notice what Solomon wrote in Proverbs concerning our responsibility. Here's a really good verse. You want a verse to memorize? Watch this. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart. Guard your heart. Be careful what your heart is exposed to. Be careful what your mind is exposed to. Watch the words of an unnamed writer, and I quote, Men will only regard, only guard what is valuable. There are not many guards posted at the local city dump, but there are armed guards and security measures at the bank or the expensive jewelry store because of the great value in these places. This basic human principle says something about God's view of the heart. He knows that the heart is of great value to him and to the one who possesses it. And thus the command to watch our heart is one would the wealthiest bank in the world. The integrity and vitality of our spiritual lives depends on it, unquote. You understand that? You don't expose yourself to things that have the run the possibility of injecting poison into your heart. You don't do it. Years ago, let me tell you a story. This is a simple illustration that I think will maybe help you to understand. I worked with a guy. At, uh, we were building the uh, we're building the North Star High School. We were up there working at North Star, and and I uh, a good friend of mine uh, worked there, and he had I think he had three sons, and he was. He raised them in a way for a while, I will say, where he was very careful. He said we, we were careful about what they were exposed to and what they watched. And so he said, uh, my middle son got invited to a sleepover one night. And he said, I was hesitant to let him go with his friends and spend the night. But he said, and against my better judgment, he said, I left him go. So he said he got to that boy's house that night and somebody came up with the idea that they ought to watch a couple horror movies. He said, my son had never ever been exposed to that before. He said, so they sat that night and they watched the horror movies. He said, here we are years later. And he said, my son still has night tremors because what he got exposed to that night affects him even now, years later. I use that to say this, that you and I expose our minds to the wrong thing, to the wrong doctrine, and it gets injected into the mind. It can mess you up way down the road. That's why the end of the verse, Paul says, avoid them. Avoid them. 
Don't think that you're going to wade into a situation and you're going to change somebody's mind. Don't think that you're going to enter into a debate and it's not somehow going to affect you. Paul says, avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. Get away from them. Get completely away from them. Because if you don't, like Noel said, it's like lifting the lid on garbage cans. And you can't lift garbage cans' lids without coming away smelling like them. Pastor Richie used to say this, you can't fly like an eagle if you're going to flap around with turkey buzzards. And that's exactly right. And you can't, another one that he used to say is this, he said, you can't rub shoulders with a swine without coming away smelling like them. And that's exactly what happens. Come on back here once. One of the ways to keep our hearts with all diligence is to avoid false teachings. Now, it is very important to understand that Satan has many false teachers who serve his purpose. And some of them are actually believers who have been swept away with the false doctrines. Second Peter chapter 2, 1 and 2, watch this. But there were false teachers also among the people that was in the Old Testament. There were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you, see where they're at, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many, here's a frightening thing, many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth is evil spoken of. Let me read the next paragraph. One of the places where the false teachers have been planted by Satan is in the Bible colleges. And this should be of no surprise because he can get the young people, if he can get the young people to buy into false teaching, then he knows they will go out into the churches where they will poison many others. And I'm telling you that's happening right now. It is happening. They are planted in these Bible colleges. I'm not saying in every one, but I'm saying this. There needs to be a caution, a major caution. Because it only takes one. It only takes one teacher that is very persuasive with his words to cause one young person to go down the wrong path. And I can say that because I know of individuals that that has happened to. It has happened to. Just sitting under one professor were at one time solid as a rock in what they believed. Got underneath one, one professor in that college who taught something contrary to the Word of God, but used the Scriptures and twisted them and distorted them and caused at least one that I know of, if not more, to go down that very path, to follow him down that very path. So I say that to say caution, to, to be cautious is an understatement. There's so much at stake. I'll go back to Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence protect your heart let me go on here watch uh, the illustration by mr de Haan. it's called how to catch a rat it says my grandson's chicken coop was invaded by rats attracted by the feed they had moved in he asked for my help and we set a couple of traps after a week though we had not caught a single one then a farmer friend offered some advice no rat he said will touch an exposed trap. You must disguise it with food. Fill a pan with meal and place the trap in it. Cover it well with meal so it is completely hidden. It worked. The next morning, we had a big rat. All of this reminded me that the devil knows this trick too. He carefully disguises his trap with truth. Don't miss this. Nowhere is it better seen than in numerous false cults and religions in the world today all set their traps of air in a pan of meal many quote the bible and preach a certain amount of gospel truth they talk about prayer and jesus in the bible but under the layer of truth is a trap of air this is the age of deception the bible therefore warns us to test the spirits and beware of deceivers the only antidote against the clever deceptions that come in the name of christ is to know your bible be rooted and grounded in the truth. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Beware of Satan's traps, unquote. A lot of times what happens is this, that a false teaching will have 
a little bit of truth mixed in with it. That's exactly what Dahan's saying. It's kind of like rat poison. If you read a if you pick up a box of rat poison and you read the ingredients, most people don't, but I think you'll find out that about 99% of that is food and 1% is poison. That's all it takes. It's the same way with false teachers. They will hide behind the cloak of the name of Jesus Christ. They will hide behind the Bible. They will quote scriptures. They will, they will, they will cast truth around, but it's only covering up what lies underneath that. You have to understand that. Watch uh, 1618 now. There is so much here. Um, we're hitting at the high points tonight. Watch verse 18. For they that are such, watch this, serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now what's he saying? They don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They're, they're not serving him, but they're, they're serving their own belly. Watch what I have on your paper here. Here is, uh, here is, it should say, some very interesting insight. These false teachers are not living to serve the Lord, but they're living to satisfy their own desires. That's what it talks about. That's what it means whenever it says they serve their own belly, their own desires, their own appetites. This verse tells us that they do not serve the Lord, but they serve their own belly. This means they live to serve their own desires and appetites. The idea here is that they are slaves, that they, are, that they are, that should say they are not slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, but are slaves of their own desires. What a sad and fearful state to be in. To be among those filled with love for the Lord and also among those filled with love for one another as members of the body of Jesus Christ, but to be controlled by selfish desires. That's what they are. They are controlled by selfish desires. Watch the words of John Bunyan. He says this, and I quote, A man will go far for his own belly's sake, unquote. And I can assure you that is the truth. When a man has a desire for something... I, boy, I've seen this over the years, and we're all guilty of it. You know how it is. If you want something, it, over the years, you can probably, all of you can think back to the, to the point that if you want something bad enough, you'll do anything to get it. You remember those days? I remember back to those days. I watch people fall into that trap now, and it makes me shake my head. And I think, well, you know, if somebody would have said something to me back then, I would have justified it with some statement or whatever. But you know how it is. If you want something bad enough, and I'll, I'll give you a, a, a really good example. You know, sometimes whenever it's raining or sometimes it's maybe cold out and you have trouble getting, sometimes people don't want to come to church. Well, the weather wasn't very good. But just go to their house the first day of deer season whenever it's freezing rain and the wind's blowing 190 mile an hour out of the north. And they're sitting up in a tree about 18 feet up with a belt around them in the tree, swaying back and forth, and they'll sit there all day long. Isn't that amazing? When you want something bad enough, you'll do it, I can assure you. When you want it bad enough. And that's, what, that's exactly this here. You say, well, what, what are they looking for? What do they want? Well, I'll get to this in a moment, but I'm, I'm going to say this right now because I've already led up to it. It, it may be fame. Uh, uh, it, it, it could be finances. Uh, it could just be the pride of having a position. Just something. It's a desire that they have, that, that they want. Uh, let me, boy, I'm already out of time. Let me, let me say, I, I want to tell you something, and maybe this is a confession, and confession is good for the soul, but back when, when I remember when we came to Claysburg Bible Church, and I, uh, came there to fill in, didn't really come there to candidate, just came there to fill in. And, and I remember saying to Penny, I, uh, whenever we left there that day, the first time that we were there down at the old church, I said, it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to end up there. That was, that were, I can remember those words. Very nice place to visit, nice people, but I don't want to end up there. And let me tell you why I didn't want to end up there, because I had pictured in my mind that God was going to set me in a very elaborate setting. And that was my desire. And that wasn't an elaborate setting. 
the walls were bulging out, not because of people, but because the building was falling down. And so God had to work and work and work. And so, and now as I get older, I realize that it's not about how many people and it's not about the setting. The building's nice. The addition's nice. But we could accomplish the very same thing if we had to meet in a barn somewhere, couldn't we? We could accomplish the very same thing. But I say that to say that there are people that get set on certain things, and that's what they want. That's the desires of the belly. That's the personal appetites. Let me go back. I've got to keep going because I'll have you here all night. It says, oh, how true this, uh, how true this statement is. I've witnessed people who have confronted with the truth of God's word, but they were slaves to their own desires, and for that reason they suppressed the warnings of God's word and continued to pursue their cravings. Watch verse 18 again. Let me read it one more time. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Watch this. I want you to notice what, the, what tools the false teacher uses to deceive his followers. One is good words. This is, a, this is referring to smooth words. The false teachers use words that are appealing to the listeners. They're smooth and flowing. These teachers are very easy to listen to for those who are unlearned. Fair speeches. This refers to language that is designed to captivate the listener. It is polished language. Looking at both of these terms, we can understand that those who proclaim, and not all, but I, I'm just going to give you this for a moment, who proclaim false doctrine are often educated people with many degrees. Not always. Don't, don't look at somebody with a whole bunch of degrees and say, well, that guy, the pastor said he's a false teacher. I'm not saying that. But a lot of times, that's where it comes from. It's interesting to me that when we look at the first disciples, which Jesus chose, they were fishermen and farmers. Luke was an exception for he was a doctor. Watch what's said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 through 28. It says, Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren, how not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised, God hath chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. God, God loves to work through a vessel that, that is not polished, that, that is not, uh, I'll say this, that is not refined so that he, can, that he can get in that vessel and he can mold it and shape it the way that he wants it instead of the way that that vessel desires to be shaped. Watch this. I want to go back to these false teachers chasing their own desires. We need to understand what their desires are and what, and what they are not. Their desires are all about personal gain. It may be a position they desire. It may be recognition and fame which they desire. Some false teachers are all about material wealth. They do not desire to honor or glorify God by preaching the truth. They do not have a shepherd's heart for the people. That is probably the, one of the best ways to recognize that false teacher. No shepherd's heart. No shepherd's heart. I could spend a lot of time on that. Watch one more time, I, I, because I want to get you to the end here. For they are such as serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. Back to your paper. Their victims are the simple. What's your definition of simple? Fearing no evil from others distrusting no one. Be careful. Be careful. We're to love individuals. We're to love everybody, without a doubt. But in the day and age in which we live in, we've got, well, let me just go on to the next part, okay, to 1 John 4, 1 through 3. I'll let God say it because he says it far better than I can. Verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, here we go, but try the spirits whether they are of God. That's what I'm saying. Okay, you can love individuals, but listen, you try the spirits. You be. I could go back and look at the verses that say, lay hands on no man suddenly. 
okay? Don't grab a, somebody real quick for a position. I say this, don't, don't jump right on a bandwagon because everybody else is as it drives by. Remember what Peter said, many shall follow their pernicious ways. They will have a crowd. They will have a crowd. Let me go on. Let me show you what John says again. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Now let me tell you, in John's day, apparently there was a teaching, a false teaching going around that Jesus Christ was not a man. You see what he says there? Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Watch the next verse. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now already is in the world. Okay, so in, in John's day, there was a false teaching that Jesus was not a man. He was not a man, which would eliminate him as a savior for us because our savior had to be of the same family had to be a human had to be a man so you see that was a major problem in john's day today and and over the years there have been many many attacks upon christ and there have been many false teachers paul here is warning in general he's saying look whatever they teach if it's a false doctrine number one mark them number two avoid them Number three, know what they are about. Know what they are about. They are about satisfying their own desires. They will, they will use flowing words. They will use persuasive speech. And they will deceive the hearts of those that are simple. Those that are quick to latch on to them. Those that do not try the spirits. It will deceive them. Conclusion, i got to finish up here. Let us be very careful concerning teachers whom we are not familiar with. And let us be very careful about trusting someone because they named the name of Jesus or because they are on some religious program. Satan will plant false teachers anywhere he can to lead the church into confusion. And that's what it's all about. It's about confusion. It's about disruption. It's about right here, about uh, uh, divisions and offenses. Is exactly what it's about. He can't steal away our salvation. He can't do that. So what he would love to do would be this, would be to divide us and cause us to have offenses in, in situations where pride enters in and you don't offer forgiveness he would love that nothing more than anything else to try to destroy the claysburg bible church from the inside we can't do that we got to be very very careful let us pray father thank you thank you for your word tonight thank you for the warning that the apostle paul gives us lord we could have spent weeks upon that warning but father we get enough tonight to know what it's all about and so i pray that Lord, that we will heed the words of John when he tells us to try the spirits. Let us be very cautious with teachers. Let us be very, very cautious. Even though they might name the name of Christ, even though they may quote Bible verses, Lord, help us to be cautious. Father, for those that teach something contrary, when that flag of uh, caution goes up, Help us to mark them, then to avoid them. To understand that to lend an ear runs a great risk of poisoning the mind and the heart. Might we heed the words of Solomon whenever he tells us to guard our hearts, to protect our hearts. Help us to do that, Lord. Take us home safely tonight. Lord, bring us back on Sunday ready to be blessed by the Holy Spirit, taught by the Spirit, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And you are dismissed.